You're listening to Where You Live with Gene and Tony. There it is. Professional styling of Mr. Duke Ellington. Man, it doesn't get any better than that. No. And uh, folks, it's great to have you with us. This is Where You Live with Gene and Tony. We're broadcasting from the Natural Green Lawn and Landscape Studios. We're brought to you by Extreme Exteriors and American Family Insurance, the Kim Bennett Agency. We have on the phone with us Dan Greenstein, attorney with Burnick and Lifson. And uh, we were saying uh, during the break, one of our favorite attorneys. Right, Tony? <laughs> that, I was saying, you're now my very favorite HOA attorney, Dan. Oh, that is so nice of you. <laughs> and uh, folks, This is how I get free legal advice from my <laughs> HOA board. Just call them on the radio. Uh, I'm, when you kidding. Get. I'm kidding. But uh, the reason we're asking you, Dan, is you, ha- you did have some great advice, and uh, you uh, pass these little nuggets on every now and again. And uh, you were talking about the importance of contracts in our last segment. You are talking about how uh, sometimes associations, especially self-managed ones, may not take a look at the idea of having an attorney look and review at uh, a contract, especially one that's in the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, before going ahead with a project. And that could save them a lot of headache. I think that's further key. This is about having an attorney review the contract before you sign the contract, right, Dan? It's it's preventative. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Well, uh, we want you to address a little bit now for the, this is for the property management professional. If someone is a manager, if they're a, a managing agent for an association, what are a couple of things that they need to remember uh, when reviewing and uh, looking over and having the association enter into a contract? Very good question. Well, You know, many managers really want to do a a great job for their associations, for their boards, and by their thinking, by taking on and doing more, that they're really helping their board out. So what they do in many instances, they'll bring some different bids to their board for the improvement work, and the board will decide which bid to go with. And then the manager will sign a contract on behalf of the association mm-hmm. or sometimes just in their own personal name. And what they've done unintentionally is they have agreed to pay for all of the work being done at the association. Yikes. It's, it's a terrible habit to be in. Um, number one, at the very least, the contract with the vendor should have the name of the association and then the manager could sign as its managing, as an agent for the of that association. Associate. I see, But yeah. I, I don't even like that. If I were advising a manager, I'd say absolutely not. The contract has to be in the name of the association yes. and it has to be signed by an officer of the association. Mm. Okay, good, oh, I, I, good advice. I can't tell you uh, trouble we had a couple years ago with one water, uh, with water utilities, with one association. It was a large one, Dan, and there was probably, oh, somewhere between 40-some different meters uh, around the property. And they uh, had, to, and the city had taken the time to put it all in the name of our company instead of the mm. association. Mm. And they weren't happy that we asked them to redo all of them, once again, in the name of the association. But you're right. It is it is an obligation for the association, not for the property manager, not for the management company. And, and the job of the property manager is not really to sign any contracts on behalf sure. of the association. Mm-hmm. Now, Sometimes with small small amounts or, you know, maybe they've got to get the irrigation turned on and it's a $80 charge or something, okay, there, there's, that's a limited risk. Mm-hmm. But when you're talking about a third-party vendor's contract for improvements to the association, we can be talking about significant dollar amounts. And let's face it, things go wrong under contracts. There are disputes. There are lawsuits. Yeah. And the last thing a property manager would want would be to be, have to be brought into a lawsuit because their name yeah. is on the contract. Yeah. Yeah. Now, one thing that some people will do, it'll come in the name of the management company, so the manager will just scratch it out and put the association's name and send it back. Now, that's better than doing nothing, but I don't know that that is necessarily as good as asking the vendor to retype it or 
one step further, scratch that out, initial, and then ask that they initial it as well. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. Under the law, technically speaking, if if uh, the manager scratches out the name and writes in the name of the association after the vendor has signed it, it's not really a, a formal legal change. Mm-hmm. So you're absolutely right. It's got to go back to the vendor who needs to either you know, rewrite it in the correct name or, at the very minimum, initial the change yeah. that was put in by the manager. Yeah, and, and this seems, uh, to me, it, it does seem uh, pretty basic. It's one of the reasons why I, I really feel strongly that, you know, anybody who's going to be a property manager needs to be licensed uh, as uh, a real estate agent, as Minnesota requires, because you you need to have this understanding of contract law. Uh, in terms of what is uh, a valid contract. And you don't have a valid contract unless you have an agreement of the minds of both parties. I I agree. And, you know, what we all kind of see from time to time is as time goes by and you you do more and more of this, you know, you can develop some bad habits and you can become complacent. So Mm. a reminder is usually a good idea. Yeah. Well, uh, are there any anything else that you think uh, that a uh, property management professional needs to remember concerning well, here's, contract? Here's something that comes up very often in the same context, and that is there'll, there'll be a contract, and it may be signed by the association or it may be signed by the management company, and a dispute will arise. And sure enough, uh, we start talking about the dispute, and the question that will invariably be posed to me as well, Dan. The, the vendor's wrong. We know we're right. If, if we fight with them in court, can we collect our attorney's fees? Uh-huh. I mean, you'd think if you win and the vendor's really wrong, you think you might be able to collect your attorney's fees. Good question. But the law in Minnesota is not that friendly. And the law in Minnesota says... Um, in, in part, in this context, unless that written agreement allows you to collect your attorney's fees in the event of a dispute, in other words, unless it's written into the agreement, you as the homeowner association do not have the right to collect your mm-hmm. attorney's fees. Mm-hmm. However, the vendor that does improvements to your property has the right to collect their attorney's fees under the mechanics lien law oh. that, uh, that protects them from unpaid accounts. So this is one of those clauses you're saying is often omitted in a vendor's well, agreement to do work. And if an association just blindly signs the agreement without having their attorney review it, they've missed that entirely. Absolutely. And I'm telling you, Tony, it happens all of the time. I believe it. And um, it, it was just a little attention to it, you can yeah. eliminate this whole problem. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the word of the day is to be deliberate. Be deliberate and take preventative action. Yes. Well, Dan, thanks so much for taking some time to be with us on the show today. You're very welcome. We'll Bye-bye. see ya. Bye, Dan. Folks, that was Dan Greenstein, attorney with Burnick Lifson.